Hey everyone, welcome once again. Each week it is a blessing, a privilege. It's something that I enjoy doing and I, um, I hope that it's useful. I get comments from people, I get encouragement from some folks. Uh, contact me if you would and, and let me know what your thoughts are, either positive or uh, things that I can improve. I, I, I do appreciate that. And um, I'm going to start today with prayer, like we always do. We go before our Father in Heaven and ask Him to help us as we listen. Yes, you're listening, you're watching. And as I try to communicate this, and I want God to get the glory, I want God to work in our lives, and, and I want Him to grab our attention. We had an elders meeting this week, and one of the comments was made that is, you know, uh, there are a lot of people that um, uh, they just they just aren't focused in the way that they could be. That's what someone else said, and and that's a concern that I have. I, I want us to be focused on what God has to say to us, and this is God's word. It's 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 profitable for teaching, for reproof, for for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that we can be adequately equipped to face this world. So let's pray for that. All right. Our gracious God and Father, this is your word. Make it come alive to us today. It is your living word, yes, and the scriptures are something different than any other book ever written because they do speak your truth. They speak your uh, desire for us. They give us a sense of understanding, a sense of attentiveness to who you are and what you've done. And Father, I thank you for that. It's my prayer today that you'll use what is being expressed in this passage in Genesis 42 and 43. You'll use it to help us see how you've worked throughout history, how you worked in Joseph's life, how you worked in Jacob's life, how you brought the Israelites to Egypt. That was the ultimate goal and what happened there in Joseph's Joseph's ministry, his, his, his leadership there in Egypt. And Father, in that, the, the Savior was born by that, that great nation that developed. And I thank you for Jesus Christ that came and paid the price for my sin and for everyone who's listening, their sin as well. And as we look to you, Father, and realize what Christ has done, help us to understand that it's our, our faith and trust in him that makes all the difference, but it's also our reverence and our respect for you that helps us to be a testimony to the world around us. So help us, Father. Build into our lives as we understand the truth that we see in these, in these teachings. And I praise you. I thank you. Help me speak clearly. Help me to be uh, understandable, and I pray, Father, that you will guard my mind and my mouth as I speak these words of truth that come from your, your scriptures. So help us today, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people, once again, we say amen, right? We trust in God. We agree that God is at work. Well, hey, we're in Genesis 42 and 43. Today we're looking at part two of Joseph's childhood dreams that became a reality. His brothers came and bowed to him, but these include God's plans, Joseph's prudence in his leadership, and Jacob's problems, because Jacob was a man, uh, throughout his life, he was marked by a sense of treachery. He was marked by a sense of fear, and Hebrews 11 the Hall of Fame of Faith, is that it records Jacob's situation. I'm going to use that right now, in fact. I didn't plan to do it early in this message, but I'm going to right now. Turning to Ephesians chapter 11, 12. 11 and 12. I mean, I'm not going to be in chapter 12, but in chapter 11, as we read about um, Jacob, it's interesting. You have all these great men of faith that are recorded in this passage. And in and, and Jacob, yes, he's included, but um, it's interesting to note, his faithfulness wasn't as clear-cut as others. It says, by faith, Jacob, as he was dying, 
They don't talk about what he, how he lived his life. They say, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. And I think personally that, yes, Jacob's included. He was a man of faith, but his faith faltered. His faith failed in certain ways because he had great fear throughout his life. Fear of his brother Esau, fear of what was happening with his, his wives, what was happening with his sons. And he had two favorite sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Why? Because they were the sons of Rachel, his favorite wife. And here's a man that played favorites, and that cost him. That affected his life. But yet, Jacob was used of God because the Israelites, the nation, Jacob's name became Israel. What does that mean? Jacob means treacherous one, deceitful one, because that's what the name means. Israel means he fought with God. Jacob wrestled with God. And Jacob yet was used of God because from his family, from Judah's line, came the Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one that paid the price for our sins. So as we look at this and consider, uh, we li live in a world today that is, that is very much marked by fear. When you listen to political ads, what are they talking about? They're talking about Americans' fears. When they do the polls, the polls of who you're going to vote for or, or how you see things. It's not just during election time that these political pundits do their, their polls. They always measure things and they're measuring. What are your fears? What are your concerns? What do you want to be different? And we live in this fear-focused world. And, and, and where do we see it? Like I say, political ads. We see it in drug and medication ads. You know, people have this illness. Oh, this is going to help you. But yet realize there's these side effects. You see it in financial ads or financial explanation about things. This week, the Fed, they, they lowered the interest rate. Some people say that's great. Some people say, hey, wait a minute now. That's probably going to cause some problems in the future. And then we see cultural concerns. We see concerns over the border. We see concerns over fentanyl and other drugs. We concerns over globalism. We can see concerns over what the World Economic Forum wants to do. Digital money, is it good, is it bad? We see all these things and people have these fears, they have these concerns. And oftentimes we're driven by these things and yet God wants us to focus on trusting Him. Our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in what God promised He's going to do. That's essential and we need to get real. We need to get real and, and look at life from God's perspective. That quote I used of Chuck Swindoll, the idea that, uh, in fact, I think I've got it right here, if I would just find it. Yeah, Chuck Swindoll says that um, we should see things from God's perspective. We should have a faith-based focus that says God has a plan, and he wants us to trust in his plans. God is never going to be against those that love him that are called according to his purpose. And we should understand that. But now, as we look at today's message, Genesis 42, verses 25, through chapter 43, verse 14. I'm not going to read this whole section, but I want us to understand that the famine continued and Jacob's family needed more grain. The sons had gone and gotten grain. They came back. Money was found in their bags. They said, oh, no, this isn't good because the money we brought to pay for this grain, we have it back. And they figured there's something wrong. The brothers said, what is God doing to us? Jacob was dismayed over all of this when he saw it. And now they needed more grain. And what was the story that they came back from Egypt with that story was, hey, Dad, we need to bring Benjamin next time we go. And what did Jacob say? No way, that's not going to happen. This meant now that they needed more grain. Benjamin would have to go with his older brothers if they were going to get more grain from Egypt. <clears throat> Jacob was stubborn. He was fearful. He didn't want to entrust Benjamin to the care of his older sons. But Judah seemed to convince his hesitant father with words that forced him to recognize the reality that there was no way to avoid this. Benjamin was going to have to go. Now, Judah, Judah expected full responsibility for Benjamin. 
And yet there's lessons we learn from this portion of the study that will motivate us to take a very close personal look at our faith. How well are we trusting God? How much are we trusting God? Are we living faithful lives or are we living, secondly, our fears? Are we living fearful lives? And then finally, what's our focus? Is our focus that God is in control and that God is working all things out for what's best? Or is our focus is, oh no, what's next? Now, a brief review as we look at this, what we've studied. Last week we saw there was a reunion that specifically was planned by God. Joseph didn't understand how that was working, but yet he found he saw his brothers for the first time in 20 plus years. Joseph recognized them. They didn't recognize him. He had a uh, he had a, 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 an advantage over them because he knew they were there. They didn't know that was their older, their younger brother. Now their consciences were stirred up through this whole process. They didn't understand what was going on. Why are we? We suddenly, our consciences are working on us. These things are taking place. These difficulties are taking place because we're guilty. They said that, and now they get ready to go back home, and they find in their bags returned money. And what did that do? That resulted in them reaching out to God, saying, what is going on here? They sought out God. Their father didn't seek out God at that point. They returned home and gave a report to Jacob, and Jacob was a man filled with that sense of fear. He'd been a, a man of treachery with his work, with his, first of all, with his brother Esau, then secondly, with his father-in-law Laban. And he was a man that, that dealt in treachery. And therefore, he was always looking behind himself saying, okay, what's going to happen? What's out there? He wasn't a trusting individual. He was a fearful individual. But now we see in this lesson today, number one, Joseph used gracious generosity to test his brother's it revealed Jacob's fears. It revealed his frustrations. It again revealed his favoritism, having a favorite wife, having favorite sons, and it revealed his faltering faith. Now, up to this point in the narrative, Joseph has been the main character. We've been looking at Joseph's life. We had that little section where we saw Judah and Tamar and all that in chapter 39. But basically what we see in this whole situation here is chapter 37, Joseph, he has a dream and he gets a special coat from his father. And that became a theme for us to follow because that's these dreams in that coat made his brothers hate him. Chapter 39, Joseph's clothing was used, not the coat, but now the coat that he had in Egypt as a slave to Potiphar and Potiphar's wife, the clothing was used to accuse him and put him in jail because he was, he was seduced by Potiphar's wife, but he resisted. But yet she grabbed his coat and she used that as evidence against him when she told Potiphar, hey, your slave tried to rape me. Had it happened? No, it was a lie, but he went to prison anyway. Chapter 40, with God's help in prison, he accurately interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. The baker was executed. The cupbearer was restored to his role as Potiphar's cupbearer. Or I'm not Potiphar, but, but, but Pharaoh's cupbearer. I'm sorry. Got my P words mixed up. Yes. Then we see in, in chapter 41... Joseph's expecting before that that he'd get out of prison because he interpreted those dreams, but it didn't happen. But God's timing is perfect. Two years passed, two years later, it led to some fancy new clothes because Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. And when he interpreted the dreams, he gave recommendations of what these dreams meant and what they needed to do. And suddenly Pharaoh says, hey, you're the man you got these fancy new clothes now because you are second in command. In chapter 42, Joseph's brothers <clears throat> fulfill his dream that they would bow down to him. 
because they came and bowed to him. Now there's one more aspect of that that needs to be taken place, and that's going to take place in chapter 43, because the dream is continued to be fulfilled there, because the brothers come back, and they bring Benjamin with them, and Jacob's favoritism. Now, 42, Joseph's brothers fulfilled his dream without knowing it. Chapter 43, Jacob's favoritism, his fears and his frustrations dashed his dreams because he's, he's living in great fear over, oh no, Benjamin's got to go to Egypt. So we see all these things now. We're pointing out first in chapter 42, 25 through 38. We've gone through that a bit in the review, but Joseph used grace of, gracious generosity. He put money back in the, in, the, in the men's bags. He gave them supplies for their trip home. This was done because he cared for them, yes, but he also wanted to test them, wanted to see what their loyalty was, wanted to see how their jealousy was still affecting them or not affecting them. And... <clears throat> that generosity, it tested the brothers, but it also tested Jacob. And it revealed Jacob had great fears. He had great frustrations. He had a sense of favoritism toward certain sons, toward certain situations. And <clears throat> he had a faltering faith. His faith wasn't as strong as Joseph's, and in a certain way, his sons were a little more trusting than he was, thinking that God would care for things. Now, up to this point in the narrative, Joseph was the main character, but now Jacob is. The spotlight now begins to shine on Jacob. Now, all along the way, God had Joseph's attention. <clears throat> Seems like each week recently I get in here and my allergies affect me and I get that scratchy throat. <clears throat> All along the way, Joseph was attentive to God. He trusted him. It seems like Joseph never got upset over the situations that took place. Maybe there were moments when he was, he was bothered at certain, certain times, I'm sure, but yet he trusted now, during the first trip to Egypt, God got the ten brothers' attention. They said to him, they said, God, what are you doing? What's this that God's done to us? We got money back in our bags. Simeon is being left back in Egypt. What's going on here? And they felt that sense of guilt, that sense of conviction. They began to have a conscience stirring their, conscien their consciences were awakened. And now the sons came home, and God began to work on Jacob. And Jacob needed some work. There was some chiseling that needed to be done. Jacob was dismayed by the various things he saw, the fact that the money was returned. He says, maybe it's a mistake. He said that. But yet... There's some sense that Jacob is just stirring up in his mind. This is really troubling. Jacob displayed anxiety and anger because in this section here in chapter 42, he says, all is against me. Everything is against me. He has this all against me attitude. And Jacob says to his sons, you've deprived me of my children. Joseph is dead. Simeon is gone. And if you take Benjamin... All these things are against me, Jacob says. He's thinking, God, what are you doing to me? He doesn't say it in those words, but Jacob is resistant. He says, my son shall not go with you. I'm not going to let Benjamin go, for his brother is dead, and he is alone. He has no full brother, because Joseph is gone. He's dead, according to what Jacob thinks. He says, if harm should befall him on the journey you're taking, then... You will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow and grief. And that's the, Jacob's perspective. Now he has this faltering faith where he's, he's not willing to trust God for the situation in front of him. He's still acting in favoritistic actions toward Benjamin, protecting Benjamin, saying, I don't care about Simeon. He's back in Egypt. 
He did say, oh, you bereaved me of my children, but yet there's not that sense that Simeon is important to him. He's got these horrendous fears, these irrational fears that are saying, whoa! And he's expressing frustration. But now, secondly, the next few verses we find in chapter 43, verses 1 through 6, the famine severe in the land. So it came about that when they had finished eating the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, go back, buy us some food. Buy us a little food, he says. Apparently, Jacob is thinking, okay, I'm going to procrastinate the situation. I'll just draw it out. We'll go each time, get a little bit of food, and we won't be bothered by having to send Benjamin. That's probably what's in his mind, or possibly what's in his mind. Now, Judah spoke to him and says, hey, Dad, I'm sorry, but the man solemnly warned us. You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we're willing to go and we'll buy food. But if you do not send him, we will not go down because we will not be able to see the man. He says, you will not see my face unless your brother is with you. And as we look at this whole perspective, we find that at this point in the narrative, that Jacob was so focused on himself and his emotional pain that he couldn't understand what actually needed to be done. With their food supply running out, Jacob's all-against-me attitude became more agitated. He's more agitated. He's more aggressive towards his sons. He's more angry with God. And this point in the narrative Jacob is even shifting the blame for everything to his older sons. Now we see what's happening. The grain is almost gone. He ordered his sons, go back and buy a little food. Obviously, he's got this perspective. If I procrastinate, if I just do it a little bit at a time, maybe we can get away with this. Maybe we can do things our way rather than the way that this ruler in Egypt says it has to be done. Now, he says, go buy a little food, but Judah tried to reason with his dad. He reasoned with the reality of the situation. He says, look, we can't go unless we bring Benjamin. But Israel said, why do you treat me so badly by telling the man there in Egypt whether you had another brother? Why are you treating me so badly? Jacob is shifting the blame. He's playing the blame game. Do we ever play the blame game? Oh, yeah, we do. Sometimes we blame people for our own problems. Sometimes we blame situations saying, okay, well, this happened, so therefore I, I couldn't do what I needed to do or I couldn't think the way I needed to think. And we sometimes were casting blame ourselves too, just like Jacob did. But now the third aspect of this lesson today, Jacob reluctantly approved of Benjamin going with his sons to get the grain from Egypt but he focused his faith on forcing the Egyptians with fancy fruits rather than with what God might be doing, with what God would possibly provide. He focused his faith on forcing the matter with the Egyptians by saying, hey, we'll bribe them. We'll bring these fancy fruits, these nuts. We'll bring all these special gifts. They'll think, oh, wow, this is wonderful. And they won't, they won't care that we don't send Benjamin. But yet, he had to send Benjamin. He gave in to that particular perspective. Now, Judah offered to take all responsibility for Benjamin's safety. Jacob, rather than acknowledging faith that God would protect his family... He told his sons to bribe the Egyptian ruler to make sure that they would release your other brother. He didn't even name him. Your other brother. That's where Jacob was focused. Your other brother and Benjamin, my favorite son. And his prayer in the end, notice what it says there. It says he prayed, um, as, as we look at this, um, He says, verse, verse 11, he said, if you're, Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best products of the land in your bags and carry down to the man as a present a little balm, a little honey, a little aromatic gum, 
myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds, take double the money in your hand, bribe them in other words, Take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Maybe it was just a mistake. He says, take your brother also and arise and return to the man. And then he says, may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man so that he will release to you your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, I am bereaved of my children. I am bereaved. And that's what Jacob says. And as we look at that, we realize that here's a man... A man that is called by God to be the father of the line that would bring Jesus Christ into the world. And he's struggling. And what do we learn from this? There are lessons for us to learn. We need to focus a bit on our faith. We need to focus as well on our fears. And then we need to focus on our focus. Where is our, where's our perspective? Are we looking at God and God's promises? God's provisions? Are we looking at the problems that are looming around us? As I said, we live in this fear-focused society where political ads are always going to say, okay, look at what this is saying and look at how this will happen if you elect the wrong person. And there's always that sense of fear that is out there. We live in this fear-focused society. It's also a society that is very, very much, uh, you know, it, it's, it's fast-paced. Things go so fast that sometimes we have a hard time thinking straight with all of it. But as we look at these personal perspectives, these personal reflections, and the applications that encourage our faith, I have several things I want to focus in on as we, as we, we close this message. Number one, let's look at the clear contrast that's provided in the study between Joseph and his father Jacob. Clear contrast between these two personalities. Joseph was a model of someone who was controlled by his faith in the Lord. He was absolutely controlled by that. That kept him, that kept him going. That kept him being, maintaining a conscientious perspective on, I'm going to do the best job I can do, whether I'm in prison, whether I'm a slave, or whether I'm the second in command in the land of Egypt. Joseph. Jacob, on the other hand, provides us with an example of someone that's literally controlled by fear. Throughout his life, Jacob was marked by treachery and fear. His original name, Jacob, meant treacherous or deceiver. And that's what he did. He deceived his father. He deceived his father-in-law several times. And he was a man that consistently lived on the edge. And therefore, because he lived on the edge, he always had to look. Well, what's behind me? What's behind me? He needed to see that because there was that sense of fear. What is coming up behind me? His original name meant treacherous or deceiver. His second name, Israel, that he received what and when? Well, chapter 34 tells us that Jacob, he wrestled with God. He wrestled with a man that wouldn't even tell him who he was because I think it was God in, in an angelic form. And he fought with God, and that's what his second name, Israel, meant. He fought with God. Now, Jacob did trust in the Lord. Hebrews 11 tells us that. But throughout his life, he struggled with his faith, and I think he struggled with his God. And we need to learn from these things, the lessons that are here for us to learn. So secondly, this contrast between Joseph and Jacob reminds us that every one of us, no matter where we are in life, every person alive is under God's sovereign authority. Whether a person is a true believer in, in, in the Lord or in God Almighty or not, every person is under God's sovereign authority. Not anybody in this world can say that I'm not accountable to God. They can't say that. We are all accountable to God. And accountability is something that is very, very vital in our relationship to the Lord. Joseph is an example for us to follow because he understood that he was accountable to God. He said no to Potiphar's wife. He took his responsibilities and his roles seriously. He was always conscientious in what he did. He sought to bring honor to God 
when he was asked to interpret dreams, hey, you can interpret dreams. You've got this special gift. And he says, wait a minute. No, it's not me. It's God that works through this process. He has an example to follow. He gives an example for us to follow. And he recognizes he's always accountable to God. Jacob was an example for us to avoid. It's, it's tough for me to say that because I look at Jacob as, well, he's in that line of Jesus Christ. But yet, he's an example that we should avoid. And he didn't understand his accountability before God. He struggled with that. And I think all of us need to realize that I, I, I will answer to God Almighty. I will stand before, if a follower of Christ, I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I will answer to the Lord as he goes through different things. Not necessarily the sinful aspects of my life because Jesus Christ paid for the sin. I am no longer condemned. There is therefore none, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But I will still answer for how I use the gifts, the provisions that God has given. And therefore, there's a sense where I answer. And every other person who not trusted in Jesus Christ, they will answer to God for the fact that they fall short of God's standard. But now, thirdly, life in this sin-saturated society where we live You know, it creates for us some normal and natural challenges that we face just as part of life. Now, 2 Corinthians 13, as Paul goes through the various aspects of his relationship with those Corinthian people and what happened in the Corinthian church, he closes off 2 Corinthians 13 by saying, examine your faith. Examine yourself to make sure that you are part of the family of faith. And I think there are questions as we take that recommendation that we should ask ourselves. These are questions that are important in considering Jacob and Joseph and the examples we have in them. We ask these questions. Am I like Jacob, controlled by irrational fears? Do things happen and I suddenly get pulled, pulled out of the perspective of trusting God into a perspective of saying, oh no, what's going on? What's going to happen next? Do I allow fear to control my life? Am I, am I irrational in the things that make me afraid? Or do I say, okay, God has this. God is in control. If a, as a follower of Jesus Christ, if I'm going to be a testimony to the world around me, I've got to allow God, God's control, God's sovereign authority to be a strength and encouragement to my faith. Secondly, am I hopeful about life? Do I see that God has a plan? He has a purpose. God's working in my life. Or am I pessimistic? Am I pessimistic about, oh, what's going to happen next? I have counseled many, many people, some very encouraged by what they see God doing, some very, okay, what's going to happen next? How do I do this? And I'm not saying that a person isn't a, isn't a faithful follower of Christ, but I am saying a person sometimes can develop a pessimistic perspective that says, okay, I'm struggling. Next, am I concerned about myself like Jacob? Am I too concerned about myself like Jacob? He says, oh, woe is me. I am bereaved of my children. I don't like what's happening around me. I am so so stressed out. Or am I properly concerned and understanding toward those around me? See, Jacob was so concerned about himself that he failed to see the reality of the situation that he faced. He failed to see, okay, the man in Egypt says we need to submit to the authority, the authority above him. We need to bring Benjamin. And Jacob, we learned that lesson. Next, do I tend to blame others for the problems I face? Jacob blamed his sons. He blamed his situation, saying, okay, this is a bad situation and I don't like it. In a sense, he blamed God. He, he, didn't, he didn't trust in the way that he could have. And he played the blame game. And do we play the blame game? I think sometimes we do. Now, sometimes maybe there is an aspect of blame that needs to be considered in our lives. Blame that other people maybe caused an issue. We need to go and make reconciliation. We need to make a, re- we need to make a sense of how do we deal with this? 
But yet, the blame game is a dangerous game. Now, do I have a hard time admitting when I'm wrong? Am I willing to recognize, hey, I'm a sinner, I fall short of God's standard, I make mistakes? Do I confess my sins, confess my mistakes before God and say, help me? Or am I having a struggle with being that person that is confessing? Am I depending on God's resources? Am I using God's resources in a proper way? Or am I trying to manufacture what only the Holy Spirit can do to provide for what's best? Sometimes I think we try to manufacture. Sometimes we try to manipulate God. Sometimes we try to manipulate the situation. Jacob sent special gifts to try to manipulate the Egyptians to, to, to bribe them. And rather than depend upon what God was leading them to do, Jacob was saying, no, hey, let's, 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 let's bribe them. Let's bring all this forward. He tried to manufacture something that only God could provide. And then finally, the last question, do I struggle in submitting to God's authority? Do I recognize that authority that God has over my life? Am I submissive to God? Am I submissive to his word? Do I see the instructions of God's word and say, oh, I need to follow those? Or am I trying to do things my way? And I think we need to realize that sometimes we have authority that's placed over us and we need to submit to that as well. Jacob needed to submit to the Egyptian authority if he was going to get food. And he was resistant to that. So finally, the last the last perspective, the last application, Romans 8, verses 31 and 32. says, if God is for us, what can be against us? Who can be against us? He who sent his son to die and pay the price for our sins, he showed that he is for us. And it reminds us that if we are faithful fathers of the Lord Jesus Christ, God is working for us. We go back to verse 28. We know that God causes all things. He orchestrates all things to fit together so that those that love him, those that are called according to his purpose, can say, okay, God is providing what's best for us. God is providing what is necessary for us to become more and more like him. Now, Jacob grieved over his circumstances and felt that everything was against him. And sometimes when, when problems crop up in our lives, we might start to say, okay, wait a minute now, I don't like this, I don't want this. But God is saying, hey, I need you to trust me. I need you to believe that I am for you, I'm not against you. I need to believe that God is working to provide what is best so that his will will be fulfilled in, in my life. And for God's will to be fulfilled in my life, there might be some hard knocks. There might be some times of prosperity. There may be some times that I can never understand, hey, what's going on here? But I realize God is for us. And this lesson we learned today in this passage of Scripture says, if God is for us, just what can be against us? We need to take that, we need to take hold of that, and move forward in life realizing that God is always at work for our best. And let's pray. God Almighty, I know that you are working. I realize that, well, I've faced some things over the last weeks and months and years that at times it's been difficult. And I acknowledge before you, Father, that moments, there are moments when my faith wasn't as strong as what I think I wanted it to be. Help all of us to have the type of faith that Joseph had. Help all of us to recognize that Jacob teaches us a lesson in how we should avoid trying to manufacture things in such a way that it becomes our way. It becomes our desire. It becomes our perspective. Father, help us to see that you're the one that is manufacturing everything that goes on in our lives and that your plans and purposes are perfect. I realize that that is a faith-filled statement, and it's not always easy. But Father, help us to be strong in you, in the power of your might. Help us to wear your armor, the belt of truth, the truth of your word, that shows us what's right, it shows us what's wrong, it shows us how to maintain the perspective that we need to maintain, the belt of truth, 
the breastplate of righteousness. We are righteous only because of Jesus Christ. We can't make it ourselves. We can't say, okay, I did this. I'm so good. God, thank you. No. Father, help us to realize that we wear the belt, uh, I mean, the breastplate of righteousness. Help us to realize that we have uh, the shoes of the gospel that give us firm footing. Help us to realize, Father, that we also, that we have the shield of faith that protects us from flaming darts of Satan. Help us to wear the, sh- the helmet of salvation that protects our minds, that helps our minds and our attitudes to be what you want us to be. And then, Father, help us to use your word, the, sh- the, the sword of the Spirit. Help us to use it effectively. Father, help us to be strong in you and in your might. And may we be useful for your work in this world, Father, as we use the gifts you've given us to make a difference to the world, to be shining lights for your glory and for your gospel. Again, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for the time we can spend before you. Thank you for the, the, the request we can make. Help us to be more like Joseph and less like Jacob. And I thank you, Father, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Thanks for being part of all of this. And um, I trust that God will use this for his glory. See you next week.